Petroleum Economists 2020 LNG to Power Forum for Asia Pacific. Uh, in this session, we've been exploring the dynamics of the LNG market, and um, we're now going to turn to a panel that will explore who are the natural suppliers of LNG to the Asian markets, which, as we've seen in previous sessions, will be the largest and fastest growing markets. Uh, the moderator of this panel is Xi Jin Chong, uh, and I will hand over to him now to introduce his panelists. Xi Jin, over to you. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks Alex for introducing me and thank you all for joining us here today. We have a very exciting session lined up and we have some great panelists to discuss you know, what it would mean for natural supplies into the Asia market. Uh, just some housekeeping rules. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them um, at the corner of the Q&A session and we will try to address them in the course of this panel. And, in addition to that, we'll try to go through a couple of discussion points and we'll have a hard stop at about 12.15. Now, I'd just like to introduce uh, my panelists. We have Sanjeev Gupta. He is an M&A specialist, uh, Asia Pacific oil and gas lead for Ernst & Young. He has done you know, over 300 deals handling projects into the billions of dollars. We also have Sarah Barcelo. She is the chief commercial officer at Mexico Pacific Limited. She's based in Australia. And finally, we have Sinan. Uh, she is in Rystat's energy markets analysis team, and she has been looking at natural gas markets for quite a long while, actually moving from Norway down here to Singapore. So without further ado, let me just start by you know, having a little bit of a context of why we are discussing this today. We saw in the previous sessions that you know, the Asia market is going to be growing quite significantly. I mean, I was just looking at the trends and LNG demand has increased from 250 million tons to 350 million tons in the course of five years. But 70% of this demand is coming out of Asia. So Asia is a very important market. But what does this mean for suppliers? Uh, final investment decisions have surged in 2019, but because of the pandemic, the slowdown, uh, investments have really slowed. We haven't seen that many contracts being signed. We have not seen any final investment decisions being taken this year. So. You know, just to kick off the discussion, I, I would just like to ask uh, Sanjeev, you know, what is your views on financing today? Do we still need long-term contracts to move ahead? Because we haven't really seen that many this year and we haven't seen much investments being made this year. So Sanjeev, what's your views on this? Sure, sure. I think maybe I'll just give a bit of a, uh, I mean, bit of a context. So there is a wave of liquid, uh, liquefaction projects coming online over the next few years, as you know, I mean, as you have uh, mentioned earlier, you know, I mean, given the basic investment decisions made in 2019 of about 71 MTPA, right? But as we know, uh, the, the markets have since improved. The JKM moved from around $2 per MMBTU in May to about $6 MMBTU in October. So uh, I think, um, I, I believe uh, the markets, uh, the energy market certainly will need the growth in demand, you know, which, uh, which is, you know, to sustain the basically the higher prices but I think competition is going to be very stiff, right? So I think what I expect is that, you know, the, the, the LNG, sub, the, and it's going to be a buyer's market. So the LNG suppliers uh, will need to play the downstream, right? Which means mm -hmm. that, you know, in terms of the capital uh, decisions, uh, I think so the, so the, the suppliers will need to play a, a, essentially a role there, right? So I think um, we, they, we we expect to see joint ventures. We expect to see the the alliances, and we expect to see the the the, the investments also coming in by the by the ultimate consumers, the, the steel companies and basic ceramics, basic essentially the power plants. So it's going to be a you know a, a market which is based upon the basic demand, basic uncertainty. Plus, I think uh, now we have the US elections outcome also, I mean, due and how it will span out. So it's going to be a very interesting market to see. Uh, but, but, uh, but I personally expect the LNG demand in Asia to, to grow. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think that was a very good summary of the different things that we're going to expect. And I will come back to a couple of those points uh, later on. But 
maybe I should just push it over to Sinan. What do you think are some of the global trends that's affecting the market industry right now, especially on the supply side? Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, we have to take the, the cost uh, as an important uh, threshold here. When it comes to cost, uh, we have capex and we have operating costs. So for the already sanctioned projects, operating costs uh, is quite key to make sure the cash flow is coming in. Um, as uh, the already sanctioned projects, they will be likely to continue or uh, come online as scheduled. That's why we still expect uh, 2020 LNG production to reach 369, uh, 69, 370 million tons, still a positive increase from 2019. This contributed by the startups in the US, Russia, and potentially in Malaysia as well. But when it comes to new unsanctioned projects, uh, we know that uh, six projects with a total capacity of um, 72 million tons per atom were sanctioned last year. So these projects um, concerned 70 billion US dollars. This year was initially expected to be another successful year with LNG project sanctioning. But uh, the bearish market sentiment suggests a significant amount of projects across the US, Canada, Russia, Qatar, Australia, uh, Mozambique would be delayed to 2021 or even to 2022, 2023, which leads the environment uh, investments in LNG to shrink to mere $3 billion this year. Uh, so among all these unsanctioned uh, ones, Qatar gas train A211 has the lowest break-even price um, as around 4 uh, to $4.5 per MBTU. And the US proposed projects uh, would break even around $7 per MBTU due to the long distance to Asia and uh, the upstream gas being sourced from the grid. Um, but uh, uh, in all, we, we take the economics, uh, not only CAPEX and APEX, but uh, uh, OPEX, but also looking at LNG trades on the spot markets and within the long term contracts. On spot markets, the non US operational projects would be definitely favored by Asia, uh, given their low uh, short marginal cost from cheaper feed gas, uh, shorter transportation uh, distance to the market and benefits from the liquid revenues. Uh, some of the projects can even survive in a $2 per MTU environment. Uh, on term contract sites, uh, the US contracts are delinked from oil and with uh, flexible clauses which will help attracting Asian buyers as well, especially in um, South and Southeast and these emerging uh, countries. They also need uh, energy security to uh, support their LNG to power projects. Yes. And, you know, can I also just ask Sarah to give some comments? Do you think that in this sort of low prices, uh, are they sustainable? And because you always speak to buyers, I guess, in Asia as the chief commercial officer, what is it that buyers want? Because we heard Sinan talk about, you know, looking at costs and bring it down, but what do buyers really want? Is it just low prices and is this really sustainable? Yeah, I think firstly on the, uh, on the demand side, as you correctly pointed out before, there is really strong demand, you know, between now and 2040 forecast in a post pandemic outlook uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and, and LNG buyers know that the market's forecast to rebalance around the middle of this decade and that LNG projects take four to five years to build. So while we haven't had any projects sanctioned this year, we are expecting to see them over the next you know, 12 to 18 months to fill that supply gap. It's really to your point then, at which producers are actually going to be able to get those contracts and take FID. And, the trends that we're seeing, you know, the LNG markets evolved a lot over the last market cycle, and it's really been compounded in terms of buyer requirements and criteria through the pandemic this year. But buyers are essentially still, and particularly in the Asia Pacific market, seeking three things. Um, the first is certainty of supply. For a lot of these markets in the Asia Pacific region, they are very, uh, very much reliant on energy imports for national energy security purposes. So. That does remain critical, uh, particularly to, to drive that uh, GDP growth in some of the emerging markets and help that transition to carbon net neutral. Flexibility is the other key trend um, uh, that's continuing um, in terms of buyer appetite. Buyers have seen, particularly through this year with demand fluctuations and unforeseen events, that flexibility is key. If, you, if a producer can't offer 
um, destination flexibility in its entirety, not just limited by a number of days. Buyers are putting a price uh, penalty on that on those cargos or on that term offering. So that FOB or at least destination free flexibility is is all the more critical again and, and relevant. But then it generally all comes down to price. Um, you know, from a pricing perspective, there's material price sensitivities. Uh, the buyers had at the beginning of the year. We knew there was going to be a period of oversupply due to a, a large tranche of FIDs taken, you know, around 2015 or sorry, earlier in the last decade. Um, but we didn't see the pandemic coming. Uh, and so they've become all the more price sensitive through that as they're trying to manage their own home economies. So what do producers do in that regard? We see those split into two buckets. There are the existing producers. Uh, there's a lot of, of contracts within the Asia Pacific region that are actually due to expire between now and 2030. You know, we see over 70 million tons of contracts expiring. And these existing producers are really trying to remarket and recontract those volumes. The challenge they have is when those contracts were originally signed, the, the pricing market has moved so substantially. Those contracts were, you know, 14, 15% Brent or JCC, and the market's now definitely sub, sub $11 on long-term volumes, 11% uh, rather on long-term volumes. So these producers have the challenge of uh, older plants that are generally less efficient, they're more carbon intensive, and they, quite a few of them need new reserves to back those um, the continuations of production. So they're, they're a little challenge on that cost and ultimately price perspective. But equally so for new suppliers, which is the second branch uh, uh, tranche of producers there, these producers are in a way able to benefit from the innovation that we've seen in the LNG industry over the last five to 10 years in terms of design, technology, um, carbon uh, mitigation measures and so forth to bring down cost. Everything we hear is how do we bring down cost? And these are key, very fundamental development decisions that are being taken by these projects now to try to meet that pricing market. Um, you know, something close to home for me, for example, that Gulf of Mexico model was a great innovation, a great disruptor to the market five years ago. Uh, and it remains a really great proposition, but unfortunately just isn't as economic when you get that LNG into Asia. So producers such as um, you know, Mexico Pacific Limited, we take that model, but we move the liquefaction point over to the West Coast to reduce shipping and you draw off a cheaper basin and you can offer the lowest landed um, price LNG into Asia. So that innovation is really key for these producers to do all things necessary to get that price down to get those contracts. At the end of the day, the lower priced LNG uh, will be the ones that get the contracts that they can then take FID Unfortunately, not all of these projects will be able to do that because on, as each contract is signed, that demand opportunity is captured uh, and that demand opportunity obviously is not infinite. So it's a matter of timing in that regard, hence the focus on pricing. Well, actually, to back to what you've mentioned, and you said that you know everyone has been focusing on costs and trying to bring that down. Um, but at the same time, there has been more and more buyer requirements, you know, asking for carbon neutral LNG, asking for shipper, uh, more flexibility in order to divert cargoes. And all this comes uh, at actually higher price. So the question then is, is there a point where, you know, suppliers such as yourself are beginning to say there isn't that much more that you can squeeze to bring the prices down? Uh, as you said, some projects will probably fall ahead, and only the most cost efficient projects will go with it. So who do you think is in the best position to, to move on right now in, in this current position and landscape? Yeah, I think that, you know, your traditional players like the Qataris obviously have a lot of volume that they're looking to sell. Um, they've got a great market position there. Their volumes aren't as flexible, uh, but buyers do also want diversification. So, you know, we're able to match Qatari pricing uh, by bringing that gas over to the West Coast. That West Coast North America space, I think we'll see quite an emergence of projects there. The Gulf Coast, I think that will really depend on how much of the Atlantic market they can capture. Those economics can still make sense and it's a nice diversification play as well for the Atlantic market. Um, but I don't think we'll see a lot of contracts out of the Pacific market uh, being signed with Gulf of Mexico players. All right, Sanjeev, over to you. I actually wanted to ask, what are your views on contracting uh, today? Because if you look at you know, what, greenfield LNG projects require, they require long-term contracts in order to move ahead. 
But at the same time, if you look at bias, I mean, if we look at the LNG consumer producer event last week, all the Japanese buyers were saying they need more flexibility, they need more Asia spot price indexation, they don't really want long-term contracts. You know, how is this impasse between buyers and seller? It's going to allow investments in new projects. You know, how are companies thinking about this? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, going to be a basically buyer's market, you know, and as basically Sarah mentioned, one of the prime factors will be the flexibility, both in terms of volumes or spot trade versus the, the price flexibility. And competition is going to be very, very tough you know, in the coming market because buyers would also uh, like to have the portfolio of suppliers as opposed to one, you know, because I mean, given the situation, you're likely to see. So I think, uh, so it's going to be a spot versus short-term volumes rather than long-term contracts. Uh, you know, the long-term contract will be there, but I think the size and scale of those would, would essentially reduce, right? So I think uh, we are also going to see basically divergence to JKM from oil linked pricing, which we have seen is an basically emerging trend we are seeing. And, uh, and then, uh, then I think coming to your point on investment into the downstream. So, so I think in order to, for the suppliers to get access to demand, I think they would be required to invest or co-invest into the infrastructure, right? So, so I think, I think uh, the, and then that leads to the, 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 the suppliers also having to set up a sort of trading functions and, and solid let's say, risk management functions. So, so I think, uh, so we are, going to, we are going to see, so I think how do they, how, how do we manage that? So buyers are expecting sellers to take the financial burden on the infrastructure, which is not actually a very core core for the, for the sellers, yeah. right? So, so they will open up the, the investments to the financial investors or to the private equity financial funds, pension funds, who are looking at a sort of different returns. Obviously, they don't want the commodity risk, but but they want a sort of structured and basically stable returns. So we might see a sort of structured in investments or vehicles being created where you know majors partnering with some of the financial investors. You know, for 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 I mean, with basically for bringing the the I mean that investment, which would uh, you know take take this thing um, uh, these things forward. So it will be a win-win situation from a financial investor point of view, a, a, a strategic supplier point of view, and and the customer point of view because it brings the basically basically stickiness and also offers it will also offer the flexibility because if we can combine. In terms of terms of bringing the portfolio of players in, would be the would be my answer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, investing downstream, I think that makes a lot of sense in order to you know build up the demand and in order to get the LNG marketed into some of these uh, countries. And we have seen that sort of strategy for quite a long time among a lot of the majors, a lot of the international companies. Uh, but as you've mentioned, it, it doesn't really fit well in their portfolio of you know traditional upstream EMP investments. So in Asia, that that process has actually been quite slow. What, what do you think are some of the obstacles that's stopping these international companies from investing in midstream and downstream uh, infrastructure? I think it's the to do with the uh, with the regimes, uh, and you know it's to do with the uh, basically tax framework and a lot of issues or matters besides the basic basic pricing and volumes, right? So, so I think, but uh, it's also to do with the, you know, like, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, the, to make an investment, what do you need? You need to know uh, the contract sanctity, right? You need to understand the underlying basic regulatory requirement and you want to have sort of, uh, sort of stability in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the framework, right? So I think I think when, as Sarah mentioned, there are a few countries, if I can name like Philippines, Vietnam, who are actually are going to be increasingly basically reliant upon import of LNG. So I think it becomes a state or the government issue, right? So so I think uh, then then the then the government will need to step in so to to mm. to support 
to support the industry and to make the investment climate uh, more basically friendlier and and i think we likely to see a change in mindset at all levels because this this is going to be i mean lng is going to grow in asia i mean because we are a net importer if you leave australia out i think all of the countries here would are actually basically reliant upon the imports most of the countries hmm. so it's it's all about supportive policies from the government which is interesting because when we look at some of the markets in asia they tend to be quite supportive of renewable developments today and we've seen a lot of supportive policies on that front but not so much on natural gas um just changing some tack here wanted to ask sinan i mean what's your views on uh, equity stock portfolio marketing i mean that seems to be another topic that sanjeev has mentioned on projects that allows projects to seek long term contracts to move ahead do you think that this is sustainable and this is the way moving forward just companies taking on equity lng uh yeah we definitely see the portfolio on both sell sides and buy sides and buyers taking share of lng projects and also provide financing uh i think they are this is the way going forward uh but when it comes to buyers um uh we need to look at both sides the uh, already quite um uh mature markets the buyers and also the the emerging markets as Sanjay just mentioned uh, for markets uh, in for example in Vietnam in Myanmar and also in Thailand the south east uh, southern uh, asian countries so those countries usually need a large financing support from uh, foreign investors and of course uh, has to be supported by the local governments Uh, but for the uh, projects in for example in Japan in China and uh, also India is becoming more and more important uh, in this area so we would see um, the the gates of opening the markets is um, uh, wider but still is not there yet it would take years or decades to really open up the markets uh, and just back to the investment into the in- infrastructure uh, question you asked uh, earlier on Chishin. um we see that china just is that established an infrastructure company called pipe china that was focus on uh, infrastructure midstream down uh, a bit downstream but so the big three uh, NOCs would definitely focus on upstream and the down sale, uh, downstream sale uh, so for for that we we'll see um the monopoly of this uh, infrastructure a uh, structure would be uh, less compared to before it was not possible before but now it will open up to smaller players to even foreign players players this is same case in india as well uh, but in india you have the country level um, transmission system then you have uh, city region level uh, distribution then you have the uh regasification terminals so of course all these three structures and downstream definitely uh, the 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 uh regasification terminals are definitely uh, the most uh, possible way for the investors to come in and just uh, uh that means uh, would be more portfolio uh, activities uh in such like uh, regasification terminals and also in liquefaction terminals when it comes to financing as well. So it's about having an integrated I mean it's similar you think it's an integrated approach in order to penetrate some of the markets in Asia which is very different yeah. from what we've seen traditionally. Yeah. Uh, but w- and also we, we need to to see different uh, countries specifically because uh, Asia is large and uh, different countries to have uh, their own pace of energy transition how to you know uh promote gas uh, between coal and renewables and definitely coal is still the most important energy source for the region when we do look at the amount of uh, lng or uncontracted lng that's uh, that that will be building up in the market especially in this period where uh, demand has dropped significantly uh, you know just to turn this over to sarah do you th- do you see this as a concern especially when you see a lot of companies build up their equity lng without actually having secured the end user in place does that make you a bit concerned about marketing to some of the buyers in asia i mean not on a long term basis i think this year has been uh a challenging for the market generally but 
we see the market recovering on a short-term basis next year, stabilizing out a little, particularly the Asia Asia Pacific region. I mean, that's such a um, it's such a fundamental part of LNG growth. And over the longer term, you know, despite the pandemic this year and, and the oversupply that we we saw coming many years prior, we do see that market um, supply really settling down uh, and a demand a real gap there opening up around the middle of the decade. From that point, it's really structurally short. I mean, there is a, a real need for continued investment in LNG. Whether or not it will be as heavily driven by the equity investment and equity portfolio approach, uh, I think given capital allocation, um, you know, conservation measures that have occurred this year, a lot of those equity style projects have been deferred. Uh, I think it'll be a real matter as to whether or not the independent projects can slip in in the meantime and take the demand opportunity uh, but I don't see the equity model going anywhere, uh, particularly given the level of growth that's foreseen uh, for Asia through to 2040. Hmm. One of the things that you mentioned was in innovative practices are really needed for LNG to penetrate uh, certain markets. And you mentioned the Gulf of Mexico model was a very excellent provider that flexibility. And we have seen that uh, today where there has been enormous flexibility that has been exercised on US projects. Something that was not really thinkable by four or five years ago. So when looking ahead, you know, what do you think are some of the innovation? I guess it's a question for everyone. What do you think are some of the innovations that we need to see in the market in order for projects to move ahead? What's the next big thing? Uh, and this is for any one of you. Yeah, I think that flexibility is key. Uh, the diversification approach will become all the more relevant as we move into uh, a supply uh, shortage period in the second half of this decade. So we'll see buyers continue to take volumes from different supply sources to make sure that you know, they don't have their eggs in one basket and they are sufficiently covered across, across the regions. That flexibility, I mean, credit to Chenier and, and the Gulf of Mexico model that they built out there, that really disrupted the market and has been an integral part of balancing this year's market and not particularly to the detriment of those LNG producers, right? Like the, the buyers are taking the commodity risk so the, the producers aren't really covered, uh, aren't really impacted uh, all too much economically. So I think that sort of flexibility will continue to be incredibly important uh, as we build out, given the sensitivities that, that this year's really brought to light. Yeah, and also when it comes to the contract duration, I think it will be shorter and shorter. So in the past uh, 10, 20 years ago, long-term contract is 30 years plus. And we see in 10 years ago, like the most signed contracts were normally 10 to 20 years. And now we see more and more 10 years. Well, of course, uh, there are still some 20 years um, plus contracts, but uh, we see more like two years, five years, 10 years contracts uh, emerging in the market more and more. And also the contract uh, pricing taxation will be uh, more flexible. It's part of the flex this day as well. It's not only linked to uh, brand or GCC, but more uh, with uh, gas itself or even with coal. Uh, that was signed uh, some time ago. And the contract could be indexed to more than one uh, commodity. That's also the trend uh, going forward, I think. Yeah, I think I'll echo my other fellow speakers. Uh, I think flexibility is one which is coming constantly across. I think flexibility in terms of pricing volumes. And I think what will happen is, uh, I expect is to, for the LNG, aggregation to become a more common phenomena like essentially you know, demand aggregation you know so we'll like to see some hubs being created you know and, and then uh, all the so we are going to see the portfolio model I think one more uh, phenomena which might come into equation is you know how quickly the renewables pick up you know so I think that's some I mean that is something which uh, may bring some which brings uncertainty to the equation. But again, I think that contributes and adds to the flexibility phenomena again. So, so I think uh, sellers need to be prepared for offering basic flexibility. So, you know, I heard a couple of things today. Where it's all about flexibility and companies are trying to do different things in order to move downstream to, just to address this flexibility. So we have about five minutes left. So the last thing I wanted to just ask is, who do you think would, in, I would say the last two to three years, clearly it has been the US projects 
that provided that flexibility. We heard today that Qatar is one of the lowest cost producers that will continue to supply into the market. Now, who do you think will be able to address all these things that uh, let's lay out their buyers need? Buyers want lower prices, they want higher flexibility, and they want security of supply. Who would be in the best position, you think, to provide that supply into Asia? Sanjay, mm -hmm. maybe starting with you. Sorry? Uh, starting with you, maybe, yeah. Oh, okay, excuse me. Okay, sure, yeah. sure. I think uh, so. The U.S. has become the number one exporter of flexible LNG. If you can, if I, if I may say that, you know, accounting for about twenty percent of the spot, and Australia is about sixteen or seventeen percent, you know, of the market share. So U.S. LNG, you know, they have access to highly liquid and interconnected low price natural gas market. You know, that's the advantage they have. They, they are offering contracts with flexible basically destination and with multiple pricing mechanisms, which is what we have seen. And also the lower and less volatile delivered cost than many of the other competing oil indexed uh, projects. So I think, I think US as a market is sort of well prepared. So obviously, I mean, Qatar and uh, Russia will have to really, you know, also bring the flexibility. Yeah, standing on the. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry, but I see that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, that, uh, from the buyer's perspectives, um, they would definitely need a certain level of security. Uh, so for those kind of volumes, I don't think the flexibility or you know, destination is that important. Um, as in Japan, they are over contracted. So for the, let's say, the base load uh, contracts, I think they are, the tolerance is could be quite high for the inflexibility, but uh, for the, 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 the more expensive ones, like the US ones, they would have the, uh, the, the ability and flexibility to uh, divert it somewhere else. I think it, I think it comes down to the, the project, each project's fundamentals, right? If you've got an integrated reserves play that's producing solely for an LNG export project, it's very hard to be flexible on volume when you don't have an alternate outlet for your gas. So those projects that are buying from gas basins that to Sanjeev's very point are highly liquid and low priced, I think we'll see them succeed. Um, it, it goes to pricing. Uh, the flexibility in itself is a component of pricing when you think about it in terms of the ability to optimize and, and manage demand fluctuations. So. The market-based gas plays, or at least indexation to those plays, I think will be very important uh, for projects that are able to actually offer that flexibility. You know, thank you everyone for your comments today. You know, I thought we had a really excellent discussion. Uh, we spoke a lot about flexibility today. And at the end of the day, as LNG suppliers, it's really about understanding what buyers want. Uh, we've heard it's mostly flexibility, it's mostly price. There seems to be a little bit more about carbon neutral LNG today and lower carbon pathway, pathways. But I guess over the next few years, it, it remains to be seen who would actually succeed and who would be able to take that market share, especially as Asia continues to grow. So once again, thank you all for taking the time to attend this session. We There is a couple more sessions that we have later on. There will be an excellent one on Vietnam. So please stay tuned for that. And thank you to my wonderful presenters for sharing their thoughts with us today. So we do hope to see you guys again. Please stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.